who should the White House trust? Let's revisit history ever so briefly because there are so many other speakers that will revisit and review it with you. Remember, this was an armed camp. This is a group of men and women that had artillery pieces and anti-aircraft pieces, and they had tanks, and they had small arms fire. They were in a position to defend themselves, as they had had to do for many years previously. And because they trusted the United States of America, they trusted our promise to provide protection and safety, they trusted our word, they surrendered the ability to protect themselves. They trusted the United States of America seven, eight years ago. And in spite of that trust, and in spite of the European Union, the United Kingdom, in spite of a court here in the United States, right here in Washington, D.C., to say that you and the State Department are ignoring the law, you have not demonstrated to us in any manner, shape, or form that this is a or terrorist organization. It remains on the list. Well, let me tell you what I think about the State Department, ladies and gentlemen. Their inaction is indefensible. It's unspeakable. They are feckless, gutless, arrogant, and naive to trust Iran. And to think somehow that they are the annoyance, as characterized by Prime Minister Maliki, that they are such an annoyance to the government of Iran that we need to maintain them on the list. It's very difficult to explain to those mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers who have loved ones in Camp Ashraf, and it's even more difficult to explain to those who have lost their loved ones in Camp Ashraf. Who do we trust? You trust Ahmadinejad? You trust the Mullahs? Is there any reason to trust Maliki? So, Mr. President, who do you trust? It's a matter of our honor, Mr. President. We gave them our word. Our word is our bond. It's about our integrity. It's about our honor. It's America's standing in the world. When we normally say something, we mean it. And if we meant what we said, then we will do everything we can, starting today, to ensure the protection and safety of these defenseless men and women who have been attacked twice. And oh, by the way, Mr. President, with Humvees that Americans provided, with firearms that Americans provided, there was a Persian spring, Mr. President, but you seem to have ignored it. Well, time is running out. The reality that this camp we closed at the end of this month, we know what it is a precursor to. It's been two attacks in 09 and 11, innocent deaths. Justification is because they're a terrorist organization. So I conclude my remarks, Mr. President, by asking, beseeching, begging. We elect someone every four years to make tough decisions for this country. Not only to protect our interests, but to promote our values. One of those values has to do, means that we stand with men and women who, who support democracy, freedom, religious tolerance, who embrace the values that shared by this country and so many in the Western world. We promote their values. We promote our own. We ignore those values. We ignore our own. Mr. President, now as a private citizen, proudly associated with literally dozens and dozens of men and women on both sides of the political aisle, diplomats, legislators, religious leaders, military leaders, we ask you to make good on our promise, honor our word, protect the men and women of Camp Ashraf, insist that the UN High Commissioner be given the opportunity to do his job let these people be freed. Let them be resettled. It's our word, Mr. President. It's our word, Mr. President. 
Our word must be our bond. I encourage you, Mr. President, to make good on our promise. Thank you.